All right, good morning. It is good to be here on this rather chilly day. Uh, thankfully, it's only one day, and then it goes back to sort of the normal seasonal. We have been living the vacation of uh, winter so far, so we've got to take it. We'll have to take today, and then we'll get on to normal minus temperatures uh, starting tomorrow. Welcome to everybody who's joining us online. Um, if you have any technical difficulties this morning, feel free to text 825-431-8659, and we will do what we can to help you out. It is good to gather together as one body this morning, both here in the sanctuary and to everyone online. It is good to be together. A well, special welcome to anyone who's visiting with us this morning or whom this might be the first time together. Before we... Oh, uh, a quick note, a quick thank you, a big thank you to everyone who contributed to helping get the house cleaned up for the Avtovdiev family. Uh, they will be coming at the end of the week from Ukraine. Uh, they fly in on Friday. So a huge thank you to everyone who was there. The house was full of people cleaning and dusting, and most of us are going, we don't do this in our own home, why not? Um, but Sunny led the charge really well, and we got things cleaned up and ready to go. There's a little bit of work left, um, but uh, I'll have some more announcements regarding, uh, regarding their arrival at the end of the service. But again, huge thankful, and it was really neat to see the churches coming together again as one church to uh, worship through caring for uh, the people of God. At this time, before we begin the service, I'd invite you to greet your neighbor, welcome them if you're online, greet one another in the chat, and uh, I'll come back up and the worship team will join me uh, in the call to worship in just a moment. <laughs> all right if you're in the sanctuary and would like to stand by all means do so for the call to worship um, this morning the call to worship comes from Psalm 147 praise the Lord how good it is to sing praises to our God how pleasant and fitting to praise him the Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars and calls them each by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. Let's worship the Lord together today. Good morning. Why don't you sing with us, our God? Turn into wine, open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you, none like you. Into the darkness you shine, out of the ashes we rise. There's no Straight. 
Good morning, uh, kids. This is that sounds interesting. <laughs> kids, this is your time to go to Sunday school. So, elementary, go with Mary, Audrey, and Tracy, toddlers, Lindsay, and Grace. Okay, please join me in prayer this morning. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that we could gather here this morning on this cold, crisp, beautiful sunrise morning, that we know that you are still on your throne, that nature can turn in a, in a blink of an eye from going warm to cold, and just in minds of, of how different and how powerful you are that you created all these things, that you are still in control. And even though a weather storm like this would feel to us as out of control, we know that you created it and you are still in control, Father. Father, I'm reminded this morning, um, as we sang this last song about mercy, that you say that your mercy and your grace is sufficient. You, your power is made perfect through our weakness. Thank you that we can be reminded that of, of who you are this morning. And as we come to your word, as Tyler's going to bring us the message, may you truly speak to us, may you open our ears, may you open our hearts, that we can receive this morning 
but not only this morning, for the week that is to follow as well. For the kids that's going to go to Sunday school now, Father, we come and ask that you would open their ears, make them calm, make them receive from a young age. May the seeds be planted, that they one day may make that decision to follow you and pursue you in all they have. We come and ask that you would shelter them from the world's influence and you would guide them and shelter them. Father, this morning as well, we come and ask for your guidance for the Ukraine family coming on Friday. I can't even imagine how it is to fly with nine people. Um, Father, will you give them strength, give them wisdom, make them calm throughout that experience and may it be a good experience for them as well as we openly invite them on Friday in Canada. Father, this morning I'm having a feeling that I should pray for, for those that are lonely, for those that are isolated, whether it be from the weather, whether it be from family or friends, or come and draw close to them. May you show them your, your presence through your Holy Spirit. May you show them that you love them as well, that you love all of us more than we should even will ever know that there's no condition it's unconditionally father we give you all the glory and praise and once again open our hearts and our ears for the message this morning we give you all the praise in the name of jesus amen Obadiah. This is the shortest book in the whole Old Testament. It's a mere 21 verses. And at first glance, it does not look very promising. It's a series of divine judgment poems against the ancient people of Edom, which was a nation that neighbored Israel on the other side of the Dead Sea. However, there is way, way more going on here. So first, here's the backstory. The people of Edom were unique because they had a shared ancestry with the Israelites. They both belonged to the family of Abraham, who, with Sarah, had their son Isaac, who, with his wife Rebekah, had two sons, Jacob and Esau. Now, the book of Genesis told us the story of these two brothers, and to say the very least, they had a tense relationship. They each later received the names Israel and Edom, which eventually became the name of the families that descended from them. And these families replayed the same difficult relationship of their ancestors. Israel and Edom had enormous tensions throughout the centuries, but they still shared that family bond. And it's that bond that was betrayed and shattered in the tragic events of Jerusalem's fall to Babylon. So when Israel was invaded and conquered by Babylon, the people of Edom took advantage by plundering other Israelite cities and then capturing and even killing Israelite refugees. Now, in other prophetic books, God held Israel's neighbors accountable for this kind of violence. And so here, Obadiah does the same for Edom. The short book has two halves. The first part is a series of accusations against the leaders of Edom, specifically for their pride and self-exaltation. Literally, as they lived up high in the desert rocks, but also metaphorically, they truly believed they were superior to the Israelites. And it's that pride that led the Edomites to not just stand idly by when Babylon came to destroy Jerusalem, but actually to participate in the destruction. And so God says through Obadiah that Edom will be brought down from their height and destroyed. As they have done to Israel, so it will be done to them. Now, right when you think you're going to hear more about how Edom will meet its doom, the topic suddenly shifts in verse 15. We hear this, the day of the Lord is near against all nations. Now, why do we all of a sudden shift from Edom now to all nations? This first is a hinge piece, and it links the first half of the book to the second half, where Obadiah announces the day of the Lord, but not only for Edom. He widens his focus to include all nations. And Obadiah says that all prideful nations that act like Edom will face God's justice in the same way. They'll fall from their prideful heights and come to ruin. Now, the combination of these two sections, one about Edom, the other about all nations, shows us why Obadiah was so interested in this tiny southern neighbor of Israel. Obadiah sees Edom's pride and fall as an example, an image of how God will one day confront the pride of all nations and bring about their fall too. It's hardly coincidental that in Hebrew, the word Edom or Edom is spelled with the exact same letters as the word humanity or in Hebrew, Adam. In Obadiah, Edom's rise and fall is a parable of how God's justice will one day oppose pride and violence among all nations in the day of the Lord. 
But as in all the prophets, God's judgment is never his final word. Specifically, remember the conclusion of the two books that came right before Obadiah, Joel and Amos. Joel had painted a picture of what will happen after the day of the Lord against all nations. He said that God would perform a new act of salvation in Jerusalem and that all who humbled themselves and called upon him would be delivered. And in the conclusion of Amos, he said that after the day of the Lord has judged Israel's evil, God would raise up the house of David and build a new kingdom for Israel that would include Edom and all the nations called by my name. And so the book of Obadiah has been placed right after Joel and then Amos to expand on these very promises about the hope of God's kingdom over all of the nations. And so the book concludes with a very hopeful future. God says he's going to restore his kingdom over the new Jerusalem, that he'll repopulate it with a faithful remnant. And then from there, God's kingdom will expand to include all the territory and nations around Israel. And so this little book contributes to the larger portrait of God's justice and faithfulness that we're seeing in the prophets. The ancient pride and betrayal of the people of Edom becomes an example of the greater human condition, all of the ways that we betray and hurt each other in God's good world. But there's hope, Obadiah says. Edom's downfall points to the day when God will deal with evil in our world, but also bring his healing kingdom of peace over all the nations. And that's what the book of Obadiah is all about. It will be holy, and Jacob will possess his inheritance. Jacob will be a fire, and Joseph a flame. Esau will stubble, and they will set him on fire and destroy him. There will be no survivors from Esau. The Lord has spoken. People from the Negev will occupy the mountains of Esau, and people from the foothills will possess the land of the Philistines. They will occupy the fields of Ephraim and Samaria, and Benjamin will possess Gilead. This company of Israelite exiles who are in Canaan will possess the land as far as Zarephath. The exiles from Jerusalem who are in Sepharad will possess the towns of the Negev. Deliverers will go up on Mount Zion to govern the mountains of Esau, and the kingdom will be the Lord's. May God add his blessing to the word. Awesome. Thanks, Trinky. Thank you, Vares, and the rest of the team who's led us in worship so far. Uh, as you hopefully noticed, after last week's very depressing passage of Scripture that we read, I took the second half of Obadiah, so we had a little bit more hope uh, in the, what it was that God is communicating through His people. And I hope also that you've noticed, this is the fourth book in the Book of the Twelve, that in all of these prophetic books, there's this combination of destruction, difficulty, loss, pain, suffering as well as hope, restoration, new life, and God at work in and around his people to bring all things new. And we will see that theme again and again and again because that's the reality of the world we're living in. We're living in a world that is broken, that results in destruction and death and neighbor fighting neighbor, but we're also in a world that was created by God that he loves so dearly that he is at work restoring and redeeming and making all things new. Today is my last Sunday uh, for working on this part of the, the sermon series starting next week. Next week, I'm actually in Gull Lake with the youth, um, and Tim will begin the, to continue us on in, uh, from Jonah and for the next five Sundays. Uh, we're giving Tim a bit of an opportunity to suffer the grind of preaching from week to week uh, over the next five weeks, and then uh, we've got three more weeks after that, and uh, we will have covered the Book of the Twelve. And so I'm looking forward to our continued journey through that. I want to tell three really quick stories. Um, and I hope they make sense to you. Um, I hope you begin to get a picture of what Obadiah was trying to communicate to his people. The first is this. A movie a number of years ago that came out that Ange and I really loved, 
uh, is called Bruce Almighty. And it starred Jim Carrey and Jennifer Aniston and, it's, and Morgan Freeman. Uh, it's a very goofy film, but Jim Carrey meets God, who is Morgan Freeman, uh, and maybe in the acting world he is. But in meeting Morgan Freeman, uh, God gives him his powers. And so Jim Carrey's character, uh, if people pray, he can answer his prayers, their prayers. If uh, he wants to do something, he can snap his fingers and make it happen. One of the things he does, his car is beaten up. He gets in his car. Some kids show up at the, the side, and they peel back, and it's a Salem uh, sports car. But right at the beginning of the movie, Carrie is a news broadcaster. He's competing for the anchor position, and he's on his way to his office, and there's a traffic jam and he can't get through, and he's really upset because this is the most important week of the newscasting year in the town that he's in, I think it's in Buffalo, and he's mad, and he's frustrated, and he's yelling and screaming, he's like, this is just my luck. And the thing that has happened is there's a traffic accident up ahead. And as he yells, this is just my luck, he's so frustrated with the situation, two paramedics walk by with a guy covered on a stretcher. And it's this incredible contrast of him being frustrated that he's going to be late to work and how bad his day has been with this poor guy or girl or whoever, we can't tell because they're completely covered, on a stretcher coming forward. Second story is this. Uh, On Tuesday, Angie and I were driving down south in the evening, um, down Deerfoot, and coming as we approached Pagan Trail, uh, or Pagan Trail overpass, we could see there was a tent in the middle of the road on the northbound Deerfoot Lane. And tons of lights everywhere and endless vehicles behind. And if you had heard the news, you would hear know that there was an incident involving a pedestrian on Deerfoot. Uh, those, that phrase should never be said. There should never be a pedestrian on Deerfoot. But obviously the tent was the person, um, covering the person. And the traffic went back for, I think we turned off at Anderson and there's still traffic back up there. And further to that, when you, there was an, a road, I don't know what it is, down south, uh, that kind of runs parallel to Deerfoot, and all we could see was taillights there. There was traffic backed up everywhere at 8.30 at night. And I can only imagine, because I would have been one of those people, had I been northbound, that was thinking, this is just my luck. Frustrated that the road was backed up, and I couldn't get to where I wanted to be in a timely fashion. Not realizing there was a tent covering a person up ahead. The third story is this. It's a lot more lighthearted. It doesn't involve death or crashes, but it could. Uh, As you know, I run, uh, and and I'm trying to run more. I've got a, a, Riley and I are in a race at the end of May, and sometime this week, I think it may have been uh, Monday night, I was running home from here, and I was going up 4th Street, and I was wearing a toque I got for Christmas that has a bright LED light on the front of it, and I know Uh, given the amount of running I've done over the years, that whenever I approach an intersection, um, I need to watch for cars. I mean, my parents taught me that as a little kid, but now I'm 44, I've gotten it figured out, and I know that if I compete with a car, I'm going to lose. And so I just think every intersection, I'm going to pay attention. And so I'm coming up, uh, I can't remember what avenue it was, 30th or something like that, coming up, and a person pulls out in front of me, I'm right on the, the edge, I'm slowing down to the corner, and a car comes out right in front of me, um, and stops, and the person looks left and right and left and right, and my, what I do in these situations, this is my thinking at least, uh, I, I hit the car. I hit the car in a way that's not going to damage the car, but hopefully scares the pants of the person driving the car. Because here's my issue. I'm 44. I know I'm going to lose to a car. But an 8-year-old riding his bike or a 5-year-old who got away from his uh, parent or her parent, uh, they don't necessarily know that. And if they ran out on the the road and got hit by this car, vehicle, it would be tragic on two accounts. One, the kid would be injured at worst, or at best, dead at worst. The other thing is the person that hit the kid would deal with that for the rest of their life, just like the person, no doubt, uh, in the traffic incident on Tuesday would have to deal with. And so I, I hit rather firmly, but again, nothing to cause damage, or I have no intent on on wrecking a person's or even marking a person's vehicle, made noise, and the person drove off. Like, they were pulling away as I hit, and it didn't even phase them. They just went. They were on their way to do their thing, to go about where they wanted to go. This is why I'm telling you these three stories. 
The sermon today, the message of Obadiah, I think, uh, has a lot to do with our identity. And our identity shapes how we do things. And how we understand who we are and what our role is within the world shapes how we interact with the world around us. And if our identity and our identity is ultimately shaped by what is at the center of our belief about ourselves. And I think in Bruce Almighty, Bruce was at the center of his identity and what he wanted to do and the job he wanted to engage in. The people that were stuck in the traffic jam on Deerfoot and otherwise, that were frustrated with their current circumstances, had themselves most likely, or you know, those who were frustrated, had themselves at the center of the situation because they were frustrated that they couldn't get to where they wanted to go. That person that was driving the vehicle had themselves where they wanted to go as a driver in the center of what they were up to rather than understanding the responsibility of a driver and the other people that could be around them and the impact that they could have. Identity is shaped by what is at the center of who we believe ourselves to be, and that therefore shapes how we interact with the world. And so today, as we look at the second half of Obadiah, we're going to look at the power of our identity, the responsibility of our identity, and ultimately the transformer, the person who can transform our identity. So let's dive in. Power of identity. Edom, this country that, that Obadiah is rallying against, speaking, uh, prophesying against, they thought more highly of themselves than they ought to. They thought that they were pretty good. But interestingly, they didn't think they were that good. They lived in the clefts of rocks. They were up high. They had some sense of superiority and protection. But they didn't think they could take Israel down or Judah down. They just thought they were better than Judah. And they waited for this prime opportunity when Babylon swept in to take over Judah and defeat Jerusalem and, and destroy the temple. And they thought, now's our time. I'm going to jump in there. We're going to jump in there. We'll ride on, their, on Babylon's coattails in, this big and powerful nation. We'll ride them in, and then we'll pillage and take what we want to take. Edom felt really highly of itself, but not all that. They didn't think that they were as powerful as Judah may have been. And that's sometimes like us. We have ourselves at the center. We're very confident about our opinions, our decisions, and who we are, what we're up to, and yet, sometimes we hold back and wait in the sidelines. We shout at the TV or the news, but we don't actually step out and do anything. We just get grumpy and miserable in where we're at in the situation around us. We may think we're better than so-and-so or such-and-such, but we just stew in it and live in it until that opportunity comes where we can ride on the coattails of someone more bold. And I think we saw that a lot, and we've seen that a lot in ourselves. At least I know I've seen it in myself. We've seen it in, as nations. We've seen it through the COVID pandemic, where people will yell and, and get frustrated, until, uh, and, but they won't actually do anything until someone more bold, more brazen will go out and do something, and then all of a sudden we've got a mob that's out wielding pitchforks, trying to accomplish what they want to accomplish. This is the power of our identity. That we live kind of in this weird tension between having strong opinions and ideas about things, thinking we're better than other people, but we don't actually do anything about it until we have opportunity to ride on somebody else. Edom thought they had it all figured out, and they rode in on Babylon's coattails. Their physical location provided comfort and protection, and it gave a false sense of security and power. If you've been taught that you're privileged or poor, important or insignificant, faultless or a failure, you will live in the nature of that identity, whether it is true or not. How we do things is shaped by what we believe about ourselves and shapes how we interact with the world around us. We notice that as parents individually, Ange and I, but I'm sure most parents notice this in our kids. Our kids, for the most part, are raised up in families that are reasonably consistent. 
I don't think Ange and I have changed a whole lot in terms of our parenting style or approach but from one kid to the next, but if you look at our kids, they're all very different. And if you talk to our kids, they will tell you, we had an incident just this week. If you talk to our kids, one particular kid or another particular kid thinks they're more hard done by than the other child. And they all have this opinion, which can't actually possibly be true. Because if everyone feels they're hard done by, nobody's actually hard done by, or everybody is hard done by. But their belief about who they are is shaped by and affects how they see the world and how they interact. And that's not just our kids, that's the reality of all of us. And there are factors in that. There's birth order issues, there's you know, genetic issues, um, or not issues, but situations in different combinations. Maybe there's some genetic issues in our family, we're not too entirely sure. But how we perceive the world is shaped by what we believe about ourselves and who we are. When I watch our kids in particular interact with other people around them, I notice a great difference from the kids that I interact with on the basketball team or other kids who are similar to them. And I'm not saying good or bad, I just notice difference. We've raised our kids in such a way to think that adults are on their side. We've raised our kids to think that their teachers actually think well of them. And so I watch them interact. I noticed it most, uh, I noticed it the greatest in junior high, how our kids interacted with their teachers was very different than how other kids interacted with their teachers. Because other kids were taught that maybe teachers are out to get them, or that teachers were high authority and needed to be respected, but never interacted with socially. Again, that's neither good nor bad, but what I'm saying is how we, what we understand about who we are affects how we interact with the world. What you believe about yourself has great power in your life and how you, what you think about yourself. So the question for all of us is, what is, what has shaped your identity? Who are you when you think about yourself? What value or lack of value do you have? Where do you find your sense of security, comfort? Is it finances or lack thereof? Is it job security or job insecurity? Is it having a house that provides you security and identity and I'm making it in the world? Or is it a fear because now you've got a giant mortgage that you have to pay? Is it your amount of education, whether you're married or not, or have children in your relationships? These are all powerful impacts on our life, shaping our identity. And the question that we need to wrestle time and again is, is who am I? Because who we believe ourselves to be is very powerful in shaping what we're up to and who we're becoming. Over the last few years, our worlds have been turned upside down due to the pandemic. But this year, despite things being coming back to normalcy in regards to COVID and some semblance of normalcy in, normalcy in terms of how we interact with one another physically, there's still a ton of disruption. Things that we used to put confidence in have been pulled out from underneath us. For some of us, it means our age seems to have accelerated far more than the three years that have actually passed. In illness continues to plague us. Getting sick seems to be, carry a lot more weight in our lives than I ever remember it carrying before. Political and economic instability is ongoing in our country and around the world. And I think one of the most difficult things to navigate for us right now is that distrust is everywhere. If you used to think that I live in a good community and I've got good neighbors and I can trust the people around me and generally going to the store, no one's trying to rip me off, that seems to have been flipped or shifted towards the negative over the last few years. Because the challenge is when our identity is rooted in the people and the places and the things around us, the more so than who we are created in the image of, 
When the world gets disrupted, who we are gets disrupted. If what you do defines who you are, and you can't do that anymore, it makes it incredibly difficult. That's the power of identity. Edom thought that they were safe and they were better than Israel, but what was really revealed in how they attacked Judah came to light when they rode on the coattails of Babylon. They didn't really believe they were a powerful nation. They just had themselves at the center of their identity. And the message of Obadiah to them is that that will never win. Despite thinking that you're powerful, despite gaining the benefits of pillaging another country, that's not who you are as those created in my image. Which brings us to the second piece, is the responsibility of our identity. You and I, every human on earth, is created in the image of God, and as such, we carry a certain responsibility. Genesis 1, 26-31 says this, in the creation account, God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. He bestowed upon them great responsibility. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and the birds of the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, also everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. And God said all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. We know the story of Adam and Eve. They do their own thing. They put themselves at the center of their identity. God casts them out of the garden and generations later, calls upon Abram to leave his homeland, to travel west. And he's going to lay his blessing upon Abram. He changes his name to Abraham. And he says, through your family, I'm going to populate the earth. You will reflect who I am to the world around you. You will be my representatives, and everyone you bless, I will bless. Abraham and Sarah have a child. Isaac has a child. And two, or sorry, has two children. Jacob and Esau. And tension arises between these two characters. They fight one another, these brothers. And we would say boys will be boys. But they start pulling things out from one another. Jacob it by his name itself means trickster. And he tricks his brother multiple times. Maybe Esau was, maybe he had some genetic issues. But he tricks his brother a number of times and takes and he takes and he takes. And generations later, we see this family playing out. Both children of Abraham that were supposed to populate the earth and bless the earth. They were to be responsible for carrying God's image and his blessing to all the nations. And we see these two families still at war with one another. So much so that one rides on a neighboring uh, army's coattails to destroy the other. The responsibility of our identity has to be rooted in something other than our own self-gain. God has given us as cre those created in his image, and God had given Abraham and his family as ones chosen to reflect him in the world the great responsibility of being his people. As we read scripture, it's not just Edom, but it's Judah, it's Israel, it's every human being on the face of the earth that has this responsibility to bear God's image, and we twist it, and we turn it. And we fight against neighbor, and brother, and sister. We've been charged with the responsibility over creation, and yet we choose to do things our own way. And we see it time and again that the result of that is death and destruction. Verse 18 of what Trinke read for us earlier says this. 
Jacob will be a fire and Joseph a flame. Esau will be stubble, and they will set him on fire and destroy him. There will be no survivors from Esau. The Lord has spoken. Destruction ensues when we don't take the responsibility we have of whose we are as those created with the image of God to care for his creation. But we have to remember this final bit. That this whole message that Obadiah brings to the people of Edom isn't about you're going to be done and that's it. It's a message to all of humanity that in some future time, the things will change. And so our final piece is the transformer of our identity. On Mount Zion, Obadiah proclaims will be deliverance. It will be holy and Jacob will possess his inheritance The people from the Negev will occupy the mountains of Esau, and the people from the foothills will possess the land of the Philistines. They will occupy the fields of Ephraim and Samaria, and Benjamin will possess Gilead. This company of Israelite exiles who are in Canaan will possess the land as far as Zarephath. The exiles from Jerusalem who are in Shepharad will possess the towns of the Negev. If you drew that on a map, what you see is the people of God that he's bringing are all coming together, and they're also all going out. Those who have been exiled away have been bring, are being brought back home and they're being repopulated around the land. Deliverers will go up to Mount Zion to govern the mountains of Esau. And this is the final phrase that Obadiah says. And the kingdom will be the Lord's. All will be made right. It will be as it should always have been. God is saying, I will take you from being insignificant to people who are prominent, from a people who are beaten to a people who are restored. I will bring you from death to life, from what was to what it should be. This happened in Abraham's family. But the people of uh, Jacob and Esau, they forgot about it. If you remember in Genesis 32, Jacob is going back to meet Esau after finally Uh, dealing with Laban and and escaping from uh, there. And he's traveling across, he's heading back home, and he's concerned about Esau. So he sends messengers ahead to say, go talk to my brother, cool his jets, give him all these gifts. And they they, they continue on, and the messengers come back, and he says, Esau's coming, and he's got 400 guys with him. And Jacob, rightly so, knowing what he had done to his brother, gets a little nervous. And so he repositions things, he structures everything, and he divides it into two, his people, into two companies. And maybe if if the first ones, maybe if they sacrifice them, those of us in the second camp will be okay. And so he sends one group ahead and another behind. And in this one particular night here in Genesis 32, Abraham sent, or Jacob sends all his family across the river, and he stays, and he waits, and he prays. He pleads with God to save his family. And this guy shows up and puts him in a headlock. And he rubs his hair. And Jacob says, who are you? And they began to wrestle. And they wrestle all night. Jacob wrestles with God all night, pleading with him, who are you? Why are you here? And the man says to Jacob, you will no longer be Jacob. You will be Israel. I'm giving you a new name. And Jacob realizes, I've seen God face to face. And he says, you're gonna, your hip is going to be wrecked. You're going to walk with a limp. You're going to remember that in yourself you don't have power. You need to reclaim who you are as my people, as sons of Abraham. You are the people of Israel. And we see right after that, Jacob positions his family in a line from his sort of least liked sons to his most. But instead of leading from behind as he had been doing all along, Jacob stands out front. He had refused or he had ceased to be a coward, hiding behind the gifts sent to his brother and yet and becomes the one leading his family forward to meet his fate, whatever it might be. Our encounter with God transforms who we are if we allow God to get inside of us 
and facilitate our walking with a limp. Jesus took this band of doofuses that he found along the way who were fishermen and tax collectors. And if you look at the makeup of that group, they would have fought with one another like mad. Jew, they had uh, Roman lovers and Roman haters. And he takes this group of guys who don't seem to ever get it and he teaches them and he leads them and he pours his spirit out into them and their identity is completely transformed. No longer cowards hiding in a room or people like Peter wielding a sword just throwing it around. And we see the church born. And you and I here today are a result of God's spirit working in people's lives, transforming their identity pushing ourselves out of the center and allowing God in. He takes you and me, young and old, rich and poor, people of every nation, those who follow him, and sends us out to be proclaimers of a transformed identity in Christ. And so if we go back to where we started in all of this, what is it that shapes your identity? Who are you? My hope and my prayer is that for each one of us, we would wrestle with God daily, allowing him to move with inside of us, to push our own interests and desires out from the center, that we might become all he has created us to be, people who walk with a limp and yet proclaim the kingdom has come. There is great power in your identity. And so whoever you believe yourself to be right now, my hope and my prayer is you would continue to move towards Christ, the only one who can show us who we were really created to be. There is responsibility in our identity to care for the earth and to proclaim the kingdom is come in Christ because he is the transformer of our identity. He will take us from where we are and move us to become all we were created to be. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you that you do not leave us to be who we currently are, but you invite us to become all you have created us to be. Help us, Lord, to let go of ourselves, to let go of our comforts and safety that may not be in mountains and rocks as the people of Edom, but it sure is found in so many other things that are not you. And so we pray that you would work within our hearts by your spirit, shape us and mold us. Lead us and give us courage and faith to follow you. We praise you that you have taken us as sinners and you have carried that weight through your death and resurrection. Help us to live fully the life of Christ that you've called us to as bearers of your image, as proclaimers of of your blessing. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Why don't you stand with us and, yeah, let us not be like Edom, but let this be our prayer. Make me a servant
Please join me in the prayer for the offering. Father God, we thank you that you have given us opportunity to be your church, to engage in the mission of proclaiming that you have come, of offering life through your death and resurrection, of making a difference in this world by caring for the least of these. And so we pray, Lord, that as we give to the work of your ministry through Crescent Heights, we would give with joyful hearts that you would bless it and make it abundant, that we might be good steward and that we might be good stewards of the resources you have given us and that we would be um, effective in carrying out your mission. Help us to trust you fully. We pray your blessing upon the offering today. Amen. I have just a few announcements uh, before, we can conclude, before we conclude our service time together uh, this morning. First of all, coming up this, uh, not this weekend, but the weekend after, February 12th and 19th together. That's two Sundays in a row. Um, we're going to be doing membership classes. If you're interested in becoming a member, uh, officially a part of Crescent Heights, um, please come. If you're interested in just finding out what it means to be a member, please come and be a part of that. That'll be February 12th and 19th following the service. Lunch will be provided. Um, and so just come and share in that. But please RSVP so I make sure I get enough food. Uh, so we have enough food for everyone that is coming to that. So if you're interested in becoming a member, uh, if you're curious about membership, uh, if you've been a member forever and you're like, what does that actually mean? Um, just come and be a part of it. It'd be great to share together. Um, grocery cards are due for those who are making orders of grocery cards. That's coming up this Wednesday, February 1st. So please make sure to get the grocery card orders in. And again, it's an opportunity to buy Safeway, Superstore, Co-op, and a couple others that I can't remember off the top of my head. But you pay for the gift card, you get the gift card, the store kicks money over to the high school. Um, and so you, if you buy a $100 gift card, you get $100. Um, it would be amazing. This is, my, this is always my prayer about this that we all bought all of our grocery money through the gift card thing. Um, Ange and I aren't there yet. We are slowly trying to ramp it up. Um, but if we did that, again, it would just be a way to bless the school across the street. But of course, it means dealing with gift cards, which is a little bit weird as well. So I understand that. Um, coming up on Tuesday, prayer meeting on Zoom, 7.30. The link gets sent out. Uh, on Tuesday afternoon. We invite everyone to come and participate who's able to. Crafting is happening on Wednesdays at 1 here at the church if you would like to come and do some crafting. Um, and all the projects are, generally the projects are towards um, very meaningful things. And so is Sunny, Angie, is it, uh, are we still working on the quilts for the Evtovdievs? Yes? Okay. So that's what's happening this Wednesday is working on those quilts that we're going to bless the family with. Uh, and they are um, coming this Friday. The current schedule, now if you've looked at or heard any news about airline travel, you know it's yeah, kind of shoot in the dark sort of scenario. But the current plan is they're going to leave Poland, they leave Warsaw, and I believe fly to London and from London to Calgary. And they're to arrive 3 o'clock on Friday afternoon. Um, and so there's a family of nine. We don't have our big van anymore. So we need a few drivers if possible. If you are able to drive... Uh, to come greet them at the airport and then drive them to their new home. Uh, please talk to Tim um, to just get that coordinated so we make sure we have enough, enough seats. Uh, so that is coming up on Friday. Again, thank you to everyone who helped uh, both with donating items as well as cleaning yesterday. It was crazy. Uh, Sunny got to experience life maybe as Olina does, where it's just like mom, 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 mom. Uh, she was directing traffic at the house yesterday and everybody, you just hear Sunny's name all over the place. What do I do now? Um, and so she was guiding and directing us all there, which was awesome. Uh, there is no youth event this Friday because we, the youth who have signed up, we're going up to Gull Lake um, Friday to Sunday. And so please pray for us as we head up there. It's going to be a great weekend at winter camp. Uh, next Sunday is Family and Communion Sunday. Uh, so the kids are going to remain in the service and communion will be served next Sunday. Um, so that's upcoming. Alette. Hello. Yeah. So um, if there is anybody who wants to join the worship team, um, yeah, you're more than welcome to join us. You don't have to. We're not going to put you up front and say, sir, the first Sunday. <laughs> we might not even do it any Sunday, but just come and join. If you play an instrument, if you whistle well, yeah, come and join <laughs> us. <laughs> um, but 
And the other thing is we are doing a, a short series on understanding worship. And if you feel that you don't understand why we worship, you're more than welcome to come join us on a Thursday um, evening as well, 6.30. We watch a small video, understanding worship, and then we just discuss what it means to worship. So even if you don't want to join the worship team, that is, yeah, it's also open for you if you want to come and join. So, yeah, that's it. Awesome. Thanks, Alette. Um Two last things. Uh, first of all, if you're a visitor with us and you have not received a welcome package, um, please make sure that you get one before you leave. And, uh, and us as the church hopefully are bringing those to you. And finally, finally, the 2022 tax receipts are in the mailboxes at the back, sorted by middle name. I mean last name. Um, and so if, if you check the mailbox by your last name and the, the receipts are back there. All right. I think that is all for announcements. Of course, everything is on the website, and she does a great job of keeping things up to date, as well as sending out emails with information as the week goes on. If you would, please stand with me for the benediction. You have gathered as God's people. You have worshipped him in word and song and praise and contemplation of your heart. Now go out from this place with his blessing to be his people, to proclaim that the kingdom has come and that the king's name is Jesus. Go in peace. Amen. Have a great afternoon. There are some snacks to share in behind. If you would join us for that, that would be great.